returning to track one after lunch. Uh, you all got a chance to, to have some this week. Um, we're just going to get straight into it. So please welcome Sean Bertrand with That Is Deleted Quickly. Thank you for the simple and warm welcome. Appreciate that. Um, so what we're going to do today, we're going to talk through a few things. I'll give you a quick introduction of myself. Uh, talk through some of the assumptions uh, before we get started in, into the, comp, the uh, core topic of this conversation. Then we're going to talk specifically about a workflow that we developed that uh, in, in essentially helps from a, a privilege escalation perspective. Uh, we're going to get into those details here soon. Then we're going to di dive into some of the granular characteristics of some of the attack models that we leverage on, on our red team and then talk about some detective and uh, preventative controls that you can all take away from this thing. I think it's pretty cool. Uh, I'll be handing out the slide afterwards or we'll, you know, we've got the recording, but there's a lot of stuff included in the presentation itself that you might be able to take advantage of that I'm, I'm not, uh, you know, uh, scared to share out with you afterwards. So a little bit about me, uh, I've been uh, in uh, the industry for about 15, 20 years, InfoSec, uh, computer hacking, basically penetration tester. Uh, I'm the VP of the incident response and red team at a company called CBI. Uh, apparently I'm an overall great guy. I don't know uh, where that came from, but uh, obsession with hacking security vendors products. Yeah, you know, I've, uh, I do a lot of bug bounty stuff and like to focus my efforts on the actual security vendors products. So it's kind of cool, it's one of my hobbies. Uh, currently mastering the art of potty training, not me, but my two boys. So from a personal perspective, I've got twin boys, two and a half years old. It's utter bedlam in our household right now. Uh, but something that's, that's really, I guess, cool. <laughs> Uh, and also, if you know anything about me, I, wake, I make a lot of subtle Spaceballs references. I love the movie Spaceballs, a lot of relevance when it comes to pa uh, from computer security. Now, password is 12345. I think somebody saw it in the CTFNG that was going on. Uh, so those that know me know that this is something that uh, I like to talk about a lot. Uh, what I'm talking about here today does not represent the uh, views of, or opinion of my employer. Of course, had to drop the uh, disclaimer there. So working on the red team for 15 years has allowed us to identify some things that really work and some things that don't work. And we're going to talk about that, but just a little bit on the red team itself. You know, we do all the things that you would expect us to do, right? Uh, we spend a lot of time in the industrial control SCADA space. We do a lot of social engineering, web application testing, and incident response. Uh, does anybody else have one of these medals from Hack the Pentagon, or Hack the Army? It was a pretty small invitation, it happened last uh, year and earlier this year, and uh, we did pretty good on the red team and were awarded some of these medals. Uh, we're experienced, we're extremely passionate. You know, when we got into this, when I got into this industry 15, 20 years ago, it wasn't because I thought information security was gonna be the lucrative market to be in. I got in it because I thought it was cool. I uh, joined 2600 meetings, you know, 20 years ago and started to get some understanding of, of uh, what this stuff is all about. And then one day, I don't know how it happened, but uh, I went through a uh, presentation that CBI was giving talking about information security. And at the time, nobody was giving seminars talking about InfoSec. So I, I really thought it was cool. And here I am 15 years later uh, running the red team. So what do we want to talk about today? Uh, I want to empower the audience on the ease and severity of some of these privilege escalation attacks. You know, a lot of people here today may know of the very traditional type of attacks, such as, as patch-related vulnerabilities, but boy, oh boy, there is a ton of cool, manual, advanced, kind of sophisticated techniques that uh, it's not rocket science either. So I'm going to walk you through some of those scenarios and, and better equip the audience to do two things, either take advantage of this from a red team perspective, do some of these things on your own if you're not already familiarized with the concepts, but also from a blue team perspective. I'm going to give you, like I said, some, some detection and prevention recommendations that I truly believe you can take advantage of in, in creating certain you know, similar to notifications, alerts, logging, whatever it might be. And a uh, relatively informal guy, so there'll be a Q&A session at the end, but if you see anything that comes up that you just want to raise your hand or throw something at me as long as it's soft, uh, cool, we'll, we'll be on the same page. So we'll, uh, we'll discuss the workflow logic that we put together, why we created this workflow logic, and again, talk about some of those specific attack vectors. All right, here's some assumptions that we're going to make. 
right off the bat when we talk about privilege escalation. For those that haven't done this or aren't completely well familiarized with, uh, with red team penetration testing, gaining domain user rights is inevitable. Okay, 99.9% .9 of the time we're going to be able to come in and whether it's through a social engineering attack using some of those obfuscation tools that we'll talk about here, uh, man in the middle attacks, super popular now, right? Anybody who doesn't know about Responder, uh, you need to know because it's so easy. Um, and vulnerability exploitation, you know, when we talk about patch-based vulnerabilities, they're still out there, not as prevalent, but we're going to talk about uh, some of those things. But you got to understand something first and foremost about this. Getting a domain user account is easy breezy. Okay, Turning that into a domain admin or a higher level privileged is where some of the challenges can come in. And what we've done uh, on the red team about six months ago or so, we all sat down in a room and, and we figured out that we weren't, we weren't as efficient and as, as an effective team as we could be. What I found was that my team members were getting dropped into different scenarios and they were running different attacks, not based on any equation or, or effective algorithm. So what we did is we sat in a room and we went through all of these different attack scenarios that we generally employ. We're not talking about interpreter stuff here, Metasploit stuff, folks. Okay, we're talking about some, some out of the box, or I hate using that word, non-traditional type of attack vectors. Uh, some of these you may know about, some you won't. But what we had to do was conceptualize a little bit about the value of these different attacks, the time it takes to run some of these different attacks, and the probability of success. And so the algorithm is pretty darn simple. All right? If you look at how long the time it takes to, to conduct the attack versus the payout, you can begin to prioritize what you should focus on first, second, third, and fourth. We, on the red team, we don't have an infinite to hack an organization, okay? We've got a limited set of time that we have to do some things and we don't have the luxury of a true malicious threat actor where they do have that, that luxury of time. So we sat down, created this workflow and that's really what we're gonna talk to you about today. We're gonna, we're gonna highlight the workflow a little bit and then dive into some of the specific um, attacks, the attack vectors themselves, and show you how we leverage these things. And again, we'll show you the good, the bad, and the ugly, and give you preventative and detection uh, recommendations uh, accordingly. So here it is. Here's the workflow, and I know you might not be able to read all of this, but that's okay, because we're going to go into these details. But what it really boils down to is walking through some of the things that require some heavy lifting up front optimize your processes, right? Uh, streamline some of the things that you're doing so that as you work through some of these other different areas, you've already got stuff going on, all right? So we're gonna talk about how we start off looking at the sysval directory. We're gonna then move into how we run some scripted attacks to basically look for certain files that contain juicy info. And, and you may be thinking passwords, but that, that's, that's not what we think. Well, we'll talk to you a little bit about that. And then we'll go into some more advanced attack mechanisms like token impersonation, uh, what I like to call Kerber roast attacks, and uh, some of the evasion techniques that we're currently using today. All right, there's some, there's some tools that probably you guys have heard of like MSF Venom, right, and, and Veil. You guys may be familiar with some of those tools. They're, they're ways to obfuscate your payload to defeat antivirus. But some of you may not be familiar with some of the other tools that are emerging right now that we're leveraging with crazy success rates. Okay, and then uh, you know we'll get into a little bit of, of our hail mary technique at the end there. When all else fails, what is it that we do at the nth hour to increase our chances of gaining access to the things that we need to gain access to? Who here is familiar with Sysvol? Raise your hand if you've ever heard of Sysvol. Okay, general show of hands. They're not too bad. So quick overview, sysvol is a directory that's on all of your domain controllers. Okay? And what it's doing is it's hosting up things like net logon shares, user login scripts, and specifically GPOs, group policies. Okay? There's also some FRS and file replication service going on there as well. But as a domain user, anybody can navigate to the sysvol directory on any one of your domain controllers. And so what's in there? What's the attack look like from the sysvol perspective? Well, there's two, primarily. First of all, is network admins store a ton of stuff in sysvol that they shouldn't, all right? Example, 
visual basic scripts, batch scripts with clear text passwords. These are things that are easily accessible from any domain user. You can just navigate to the domain controller, hit the sysfile directory, and start looking for some of those specific scripts that are in there. We have done this a lot. We have found tons of local administrator passwords in Visual Basic scripts, a bunch of other different things that are, that are just there for the taking. And oftentimes, they're you know, most considered a, a low-hanging fruit type vulnerability. There's another one out there, MS1425. Um, the easiest way I can describe this is in a big environment, uh, what you want to do is eliminate the sneaker netting in the environment, right? If I want to change the local administrator password on all my workstations, last thing I'd want to do is walk over to each and every single computer and have to type that in. So what this sysvol GPO allows you to do is to set the local administrator password across all of your different workstations, okay? There's a problem, though, because the... Well, let's just take a look at the problem. Here's what, here's what this looks like. If you look at the actual GPO or the actual XML file here, you'll see this C password is, is a hash password. Um, about two years ago, a Microsoft developer on the MSDN network accidentally posted the private key for this bad on a public, public forum, nonetheless. So cat's out of the bag. There's now exploit code that you can literally take this is just a little PowerShell script. You fire in your hash, you get the clear text password. Local administrator writes on every computer that has this GPO applied to it. You guys should know, if you don't, once you get local admin, it's all about escalating privileges. So that's really what we're trying to do, is we're trying to do this, this crawl, walk, run scenario uh, to find things that'll get us to either that domain admin or the crown jewels sooner rather than later, okay? So, quick recap. For you, from a prevention perspective, if you do nothing, leave this building as a network admin or security admin and look at your sys file directory. Do a search for VBS scripts and, and, and see what you see. Do a, a search for batch scripts and see what you see. Probably bet dollars to donuts, you'll find some type of vulnerability in there that somebody could capitalize on, okay? Don't store creds in script files and make sure you're patched against 1425. 1425 is more of a manual patch. You won't find it like a Windows update, so you gotta go in there, apply it manually, uh, make sure you do. This is why we still see you know, this, this vulnerability from 2014 prevalent in environments today, okay? All right, so we've done a quick little search of sysvol. We may or may have not found some stuff. What we really want to do now is, is do some things in an automated fashion, in, a, in a, almost like a cruise control perspective, and that's what we call unattended file searching. So again, having been in this industry for a while, you know, 10, 12 years ago when we, when we were able to come in on day one and get domain administrator access it, it, within hours or minutes, that was usually enough to raise the eyebrows of the C-level executives and the stakeholders within the project. No longer is that the case today, because it's so easy. What's important today is find things, more than just passwords, all right? So when you're looking at intellectual property, when you're looking at the crown jewels, when you're looking at all these different areas where uh, th that data is more important than the privilege itself, we want to start some things now because as you know, searching through uh, terabytes of files is not easy and it's not quick. So what we want to do here at this process within the workflow is start looking for data, okay? That could be in the form of passwords, that can be in the form of intellectual property, that can be in the form of a number of different fields. But really what we're looking for is high value information. And some of the ways, <clears throat> excuse me, that we do that is obviously we look at file shares, we look at email, we look in the registry, SAM, and the way that we do that is through custom PowerShell scripting. So we've developed some tools over the years that allow this to, us to do this in a more automated, operationalized fashion. You can, you can look at some things manually. You can look at Metasploit auxiliary modules that offer some of this inherent capabilities, but we've put some stuff together that allows us to kind of push play and then look at some other stuff while those file searches and that data searching is going on. And if we see any hits on it, then we can focus back. But this is where the heavy lifting is that we want to start up front so that we don't have to do this at the end of the engagement. 
Um, so, you know, from an exploit perspective, we talked about, the, you know, Nessus actually has a content discovery tool. We've sometimes leveraged that in, in the environment. We've got domain user. We can leverage the tool to find some sensitive data, credit card numbers, social security numbers. There's all these predisposed policies or pre-canned policies right off the bat that can sometimes be uh, beneficial in certain environments. DLP. We've hacked into customers' DLP environments, their portals themselves, and really start to understand where the critical data is. Why do I need to go look for it when I've got one repository? If I can find access to their data, uh, their data loss prevention, uh, I can get it all there. So prevention perspective, obviously DLP is a great way, you know, double-edged sword. But uh, leverage DLP in a fashion to find the things that you might not be aware of. Great example, why don't you point your DLP solutions to looking at the sysvol directory, looking for password terms or any other regex expressions that you can think of that might be beneficial. Uh, same thing holds true here. DLP can, use, can, can be used and better optimized in a ton of different environments that we see. And vulnerability content scanning. If you have an operationalized vulnerability management program today, you should absolutely think about leveraging some of the content searching capabilities as well. It's a little bit more than DLP, a little bit less at times, but something that you should begin to explore. Okay, so what we've done is basically walk through this side of the workflow and we're on autopilot now, all right? So now we're gonna get into, uh, now we're gonna get jiggy with it, all right? We're gonna start to look into some things that are a little bit more advantageous for us Assuming now we've got a domain user, right? What we want to do now is search for all local administrator rights on the network using the SMB login script from Metasploit. Is anybody familiar with the SMB login script? So let's say you have a domain user and you want to see what rights that domain user has across the enterprise. What you're going to do is you're going to fire in those credentials to the SMB login script and you're going to say, scan the network and tell me what other machines this guy or girl or this, this set of credentials has access to. Most of the time, you're going to find a few boxes that have local administrator rights. This, this is either advertent or inadvertent. My team and I just did something for a, a big food manufacturing company about two or three months ago when we were like, uh, they were like, there's no way Jay Smith is going to have any local admin access to any of the servers. We prohibit that from happening. We found like five or seven servers where he did, and we had domain admin in seconds after that. All right. So again, something you can take out of here and, and well, jumped ahead. So what we're going to do is, is we're going to scan. We're going to find a bunch of different systems now that have local administrator rights. Then what? Then what do we do? And this is where it kind of gets a little more fun, in my opinion. So now we're moving into some more of the advanced attacks here, okay? So we've done all these things. We're in autopilot. We've got our local admin rights that we've got on a few boxes. We're going to begin to attack those specific machines. Token impersonation attacks. Cream of the crop, one of the easiest ways that we leverage to gain access to an environment without a lot of heavy lifting. In addition, we like to fly under the radar. We are all about eliminating logs to your SIM, to your threat hunting, to all of the correlation metrics that you have in your device. And some of these next few topics I'm going to be talking to you about will do just that. They're very non-intrusive, extremely uh, not very noisy at all either. So token impersonation, uh, think, of, think of tokens uh, very much like cookies, if you will. Uh, they're basically a way to ensure that your session state is validated without having to send your username and password all the time. Okay, so that token is cached on certain servers or machines. So let's say I, as the domain admin, need to log into, uh, into this guy's box for some reason. And uh, I, as a domain admin, logged in there. I, I authenticated successfully. And then I killed my session, maybe RDP or whatever. Well, the token that I used to log into that device is still present on that machine. And it's there for a while. So what we can do is impersonate that token. And remember, we're still a domain user. So anybody here that runs an organization's, you know, your network administration, security, whatever, any domain user can do this stuff. Okay, so now we're looking at leveraging 
Metasploit here, okay? And, and so we've used the Meterpreter session that we've got earlier. Remember, we've already compromised the box through the SMB login script. We've, we've looked at who's out there. We've got a local administrator. We dropped the Meterpreter session on there through a number of different ways, which we will talk about in a little bit. And we load up Incognito. All right, anybody familiar with Incognito? Incognito is a additional module in Metasploit that allows you to do some cool things like token impersonation and token snarfing. And so basically, it's really easy, okay? First, we need to get system, all right? We've we got to be a system here uh, to do this, which is really easy with uh, elevation in, in Metasploit and Meterpreter. Then what we do is load incognito, and then what we do is we list the tokens available. Okay, so now when we list the tokens with this dash u parameter, we're looking at all user tokens here. And who do we see here? We've got this Alice, all right? Let's assume Alice is a domain administrator. That's what we want to see, okay? Now I've got a target. Now I need to impersonate this token. By impersonating that token, now I will have the same darn level of permissions that Alice does, okay? It's that simple. And to do it, we use incognito, part of Metasploit, we're going to impersonate this token, okay? And once we're impersonated, we drop into a shell, we validate through who am I, and we see that we're actually the administrator itself. Okay, it's that simple. It takes minutes to run this attack. So there's ways that we can prevent against this, all right? And we're going to talk about that. But again, a review perspective, get local administrator access first. Identify those juicy to tokens that you want to impersonate because if you think about it, you've got many different machines that you can look at. Generally speaking, it usually takes us a few machines to find a domain administrator token that's, that's been dropped on, all right? It's usually not the first time. We'll impersonate that token with incognito, exploit, and then land and expand, right? Then we'll move laterally, we'll start data exfiltration, all that good stuff. But tokens are an extremely easy way for your existing domain users or any, dis any uh, malicious threat actor who gets domain user access to expand those privileges real quickly. How do you stop it? How do you detect it, first of all? What people don't know is that you can turn off impersonation on your high value targets which you should, all right? If there's any accounts out there, such as domain admins or high value targets, anybody with elevated privileges, you want to turn this stuff off, people, all right? And it's relatively easy to do so through GPOs and uh, other domain account settings, but it's basically what you can see here. This says account is sensitive and cannot be delegated, okay? It's a really simple fix. Now, there's certain situations where you may need impersonation capabilities, but very rarely, very rarely, okay? All right, moving on to Kerberos and SPN tickets. Has anybody ever heard of an SPN ticket, service principal name? All right, kind of the same thing with tokens, all right? SPNs are tickets that are stored on, on your domain controllers or file servers that basically do the same thing from a, a, a user perspective except with services, all right? So we all have services that are running within our network, right? Services are running all the time. Well, we don't need to send the service username and password on every single request that that service needs to make. We've got backup exec or backup services. We've got uh, antivirus services. We've got all sorts of services running throughout the environment. Um, I bet a lot of you know that, first of all, services are usually running under higher privileged accounts, right? Generally, services, which was we've seen, have bad passwords, have easy, easily guessed passwords, okay? So SPN ticketing, as we call it, uh, is a way where any valid domain user can request a ticket for any domain service. Let me repeat that and then tell you what that means. Any domain user in your environment today can query your, your servers, and this is what they get. What is this? First of all, little tool from Impacket, one of our very reputable, incredible open source tools and, and security groups out there. Impacket offers this script, this Python script called Git User SPNs. And really, all you need to do is provide it with the domain info, your username, your password, not my password, and uh, it'll spit back the actual tickets, 
Okay, now what's in this ticket? Let's, let's dissect this a little bit. First of all, this is what's called a KRB5 TGS, a Kerberos 5 TGS hash. If you're familiar with NTLM v2 hashes, if you're familiar with uh, other hashes, this is a long ass hash, okay? And I had to truncate it because it wouldn't all fit on this screen. So what does a long hash mean? Generally harder to crack, right? But not all the time. So now, as a domain user, I've got your SQL administrator service, I've got whatever uber crazy high value target user or service that's in there as well too. And now I need to crack these hashes. Now when we go into environments and we do this, we generally get a ton of different service principal tickets, okay? And it's easy for us to figure out which ones we want to focus on because of the name of the account. It's relatively simple. So how do we crack those hashes? How else? Hashcat. John the Ripper, uh, um, you got to use the um, other version of John, I can't remember, John Combo or something. It's, uh, John doesn't work that well, Hashcat does for these KRBG, uh, KRB5 TGS hashes. So you fire up Hashcat, you tell it what type of hash you're looking at, in this case these SPNs are 13100, and uh, you go to town. Now it generally takes a little bit longer to crack these hashes, but uh, not forever, and I'm telling you, you know, when the password on some of these is very simple, it doesn't take that long. So now, again, within a series of minutes, because this doesn't take long, this is, this is something that takes 20 minutes to run, if that, five, 10 minutes, uh, we've got the hashes for your high-privileged service accounts in addition to hopefully having cracked a few of these as well, okay? So if we're not successful here, we'll move on, but generally, we, we find a lot of success in these service principal names, but a lot of the things I'm describing to you today, they're, uh, they're tough to detect and they're tough to prevent. Okay, uh, that's why we do them. <laughs> that's exactly why we do them. So there's some things that we can do, but real quickly that overview, the first thing we do is we've got to get those SPN tickets. We've got to identify which ones we want to try to grab and crack. We request those hashes and we crack the hashes. Not rocket science, pretty simple. But to detect and prevent this stuff, there's a little bit more to it than that. So we've been doing this for a lot, and we've actually had to kind of construct our own detection and prevention mechanisms here. There's not too much out there that tells you how to do this stuff. But first of all, I mean, password complexity first and foremost, right? We assessed an international airport uh, six months ago or so where we did this, got a ton of hashes, and we collaborate with our clients as we're, we're conducting. We're not like the wizard behind the curtain shop where we're like, you can't see what we're doing. We're, we're like, come on and see what we're doing. And he's like, you're not, you're not, you're not going to crack those. They're 26 characters long, uppercase, lowercase, numeric, special characters, ASCII, all sorts of stuff. So that is a great defense mechanism against some of these vulnerabilities, the, the SPN tickets. Monitoring is, and some people will say, you know, detection is more important than prevention because I want to see what's going on, and, and I'm sometimes one of those guys, but. There's a couple ways that you can look for these specific requests. First of all, a standard domain user shouldn't be making a ton of these requests to pull down SPN tickets. So if you can look, first of all, by enabling Kerberos service ticket request monitoring, you can then look for excessive, what are called 4769 events, that's the event ID that you want to look for. We've had customers build these rules in their SIMs, in their threat honey, in all these different areas. And we're actually working with some security vendor products as well to make sure that they figure this stuff out as well too. Okay, so if, if nothing, start looking for abnormal 4769 accounts, but to do that, you've got to enable Kerberos service ticket request monitoring advanced logging. Okay? All right, so we're doing good on time. All right, so by this stage, most of the time we've got domain admin, we've got the crown jewels, we've got what it is that we need to find the critical data, but not always. So now what we're generally facing is some nasty or you know, traditional antivirus that somehow is able to detect some things that we were doing. SMB login uh, can sometimes be detected. PS exec. So if you're familiar with PS exec, this is a great way to leverage to uh, drop shells onto machines, but it's an also a sure way to get flagged by antivirus. So 
A little bit about evasion, a little bit about obfuscation. I'm sure all of you here in this room today are having discussions about endpoint security, about advanced threat protection, about EDR, about all those things that are non-traditional antivirus security. Well, let's tell you what we can do today to defeat those technologies, and hopefully it influences your decisions and the questions that you're asking your vendors if they can detect this stuff, all right? So, there's lots of tools out there. Empire, great PowerShell, PowerShell exploitation framework, Venom and Veil, two strong programs historically that did a really good job back in the day of, of defeating antivirus. But what we're seeing, they don't work that well anymore because the antivirus folks have caught on. The EDR, the advanced t uh, threat guys have, have caught on to some of, some of the signatures. And the way that they define those signatures is by looking at the ways that these products obfuscate the code or are trying to in inject the dynamic shell code into whatever pay payload that it is that you're using. So along comes this product called Shelter. Anybody here Shelter? Oh. <laughs> All right. If you haven't, you will after this. Shelter is the, is the latest and greatest way to bypass antivirus. And it can be combined with both file and file list capabilities. File list malware is all the rage now. Now, there's a little bit about it, but not, not everything. So let's talk about what Shelter is. It is a dynamic shell code injection tool. You take a standard Windows 32 executable, it only works on 32-bit right now, um, and you inject your nasty malware into that executable, OK? And the cool thing, I'm going to talk about stealth mode here in a little bit, but the cool thing and the way that this works is that it's not applying those same modifications, such as changing memory access permissions, uh, that Empire, Venom, and Veil do. Okay, so right now, Empire, Venom, and Veil, they're getting detected by most all, all of the AV products. Shelter, not many, if at all. Okay, we just did a, uh, an engagement a few weeks ago, uh, blasted through their uh, situation there. We also worked recently with, uh, with Kaspersky, and we're able to do some bypassing there as well. But what we really like about this is what's called stealth mode. So if you know anything about attacking an organization, um, when you deliver your payload, which by there's a lot of different mechanisms that I'm going to talk about on how we deliver this payload, but let's just talk about a typical social engineering attack. You deliver an EXE, right? Uh, user clicks on EXE and you know something pops up on their screen and then maybe goes away. Uh, there's some things there that just don't look right. So with Shelter, what you can do is enable stealth mode, and what it does is it enables the native functionality of the application to still do what it needs to do. So if I backdoored calc.exe, and then I deliver it to one of my targets, and they double click it, guess what? Calc is going to show up, and they can actually do some calculations. All right, But when they launch it, it's also launching my, my shell code. It's also injecting the payload. And uh, it's super easy to run. I mean, this, this is really easy to run. Runs in Kali, runs in Windows, uh, and uh, it's really easy. So what we do here is we run Shelter. If you're in uh, a Linux distro, you need Wine. But um, you basically say, I want to run it in automatic mode. You're going to choose the executable that you want to backdoor in, in, in Kali. For those that know the Kali, they're in user, share, Win32 binaries. There's a ton of binaries already in there for your exploitation pleasure. Um, P-Link is, is one of them I used here. Netcat, RAdmin, a few others. Those are good examples of, of, of executables that you can begin to backdoor. Here I've just used this P-Link executable. I basically run through a series of different next, 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 and it's going to run a series of different obfuscation techniques against this payload. It's going to run through a first stage. It's going to run through a second stage. And it takes time. Uh, if you're running it in Linux and you're using Wine, it takes about 60 seconds to actually obfuscate the code. And again, remember, it's not doing the dumb things like Veil and some of the others are, like modifying permissions in the memory space. Uh, this is really, really cool. Here's, here's you know, first stage filtering. Do I want to enable stealth mode so that I, I retain that native functionality of the application I'm looking to backdoor, or do I not care? And Here's where you could also leverage some of the you know, existing tool sets that you have. So today, 
with shelter, you can bind it to a interpreter shell if that's what you want to do. Okay, you can bind it to your own shell if you want as well. So in this case, I said, yep, I'm going to choose a listener. I'm going to look over interpreter reverse HTTPS, and uh, here's my local host. Here's my L port. And so when they launch the executable, obviously it's going to connect back to that IP address on the interpreter session that I'm running. But when I run finish up the shelter payload, what you'll see is it makes sure that it's actually going to work and that the shell code was legitimate, that it's verified, that we know we got it in there, it's obfuscated in the manner that we need, and, uh, and it works. So here it is. I mean, that's what it looks like when it's all done. It's just right there, plink.exe. Now you're ready to plug and play, send it to whomever you want. Um, I'll tell that story later, but there's, uh, there, there's a lot of plug and play functionality here. Real, real easy. All right, I'll tell this story now. We were at an engagement last week, two weeks ago, and we had to use 0365 to deliver this, this P-Link or this exploit. And uh, crazy, Microsoft was listening, I guess I would say. So we sent it through 0365 to our, our, our targeted uh, employees, our, our targeted employees, and we had an interpreter session sitting there waiting. And then all of a sudden, we start to get a couple shells. But they're not from our customer. They're from Microsoft's detonation camp. <laughs> they, they picked up on our threat, checked out the executable, launched it, and we could see Microsoft popping. You know, we were getting shells popped. But it was, it was you know, like the name of the, sh the machine was IT system forward slash admin. We saw these things correlated the IP addresses. We were like, Oh shit, it's Microsoft detonating our malware. This is kind of cool on one hand, on the other. We gotta check our terms of service real quick here. <laughs> so uh, that's shelter. But there's, you know, we gotta talk a little bit about how you deliver that payload because now you've just got this executable. If you're inside the network or outside the network, there's a lot of different ways that you can use this. Veil Catapult rightfully named, is a way to deliver your payload using a bunch of different exploitation techniques uh, as long as you've got domain user capabilities. If you're familiar with the Power Up PowerShell scripts, it uses some of those similar functions to get the payload to your computer that you want it on and also to run it. That's the thing. So. Um, we here rely, you can use client-side exploits, but those are dead in my opinion. What I mean by that is, you know, I shouldn't say they're dead, especially with Tavis's little drop here on, uh, uh, earlier this week, but they're, um, they're no longer as prevalent as they used to be. So we're talking either client-side operating system vulnerabilities, uh, we're talking application, oper application vulnerabilities at this stage, Java, Adobe, all those things. Those can be one way you can deliver this. But PowerShell's web delivery mechanism is pretty slick. We can invoke a PowerShell script that says, go out and get this executable, kick it off. Just like that, okay? And then Metasploit's got some similar web delivery capabilities. Uh, you could use psexec to do this as well with kind of like an auto run function. But uh, we try to stay away from interpreter nowadays. It's really easy to see the first stage get caught by AV or other detection mechanisms. But uh, PowerShell, I mean, for all, all of you that have heard of laying off the land or living off the land, that's the latest buzzword, which means these fileless malware attacks are taking advantage of the native tools we have on the operating system right now. Why do I need to install some special Netcat tool when I got PowerShell? Couldn't do it for me. And AV is not going to pick it up. So those are some ways that we can deliver uh, this specific payload. So what do we do? Again, quick overview. We generate that payload. I use the Ron Papil method, set it and forget it. Simple, nobody knows Ron Papil? No? Okay, good. Set it and forget it, deliver the payload, reap your shells, all right? Data exfiltration, move laterally, laterally and uh, land and expand. Detecting and preventing shelter payloads. So this goes against a lot of other different payloads, but this is tough. I and our team wouldn't be using this right now if it was easy to detect and easy to prevent, all right? So it's, it's, it's relatively difficult. You can look at some of the different fileless memory malware tools. Listen, I'm not an advocate of any, any specific product to defeat a specific attack vector. I mean, there's solutions that are better suited to do certain things. But, you know, Semantic's got some stuff out there, Carbon Black, Tanium, whatever. I haven't tested it against any of these because every environment we've dropped it into has just blown the doors off everything. There's a chance that, that some of this stuff might pick it up, but we haven't seen it. I am a huge 
exclamation mark, exclamation mark, exclamation mark, huge comp uh, proponent of, of whitelisting. It's really hard to do though. At an endpoint, if I say, these are the only applications that you're allowed to run and everything else is explicitly denied, that's tough to do. But guess what those high mission critical environments do? They do just this. You know, nuclear, um, other governments, uh, some ICS SCADA stuff. It is a pure whitelisting environment because the, wor it's, the risk and the reward factor is, is an easy equation. Spending the time to create a whitelist is, uh, is worth it, all right? Uh, again, whitelisting, just as a side note, when you think about just content filtering, uh, one of the recommendations that we make to our customers, and it's hard to do, but uh, see if you can't, if you're doing content filtering today from an internet perspective, these are the sites you're allowed to get to, these are the ones you're not. Try to block uncategorized sites, and again, that's tough, I know, you're mad upheaval with your users, but boy, when we use our social engineering attacks, uh, the domains that we stand up, the, the IPs that we're standing up, they're all uncategorized. So by simply making that, that change and saying, you know what, we're going to block all sites that aren't categorized, it's a really strong defense mechanism. Okay? All right, and then monitoring. Monitoring for unexpected creation of services, tunneling traffic, user privileges. On a show of hands, I'm just curious, who here today monitors who's being added to the domain admin group? Do you get an alert? Cool, not bad, I like that, not bad. More of you should be doing it. It is a number one thing. I mean, what we do is we usually drop in our own back door, we'll name it the name of our company or something funny. Um, and then we were at a company uh, four or five months ago, a guy runs in, he's like, I saw you, I saw you, I saw you. I was like, great, that's awesome. We're gonna talk a little bit about creation of services and how to monitor for spawn services, things that some of these attack vectors leverage. But you know, it, it's getting hard out there, folks. It's getting harder from a detection perspective, but there are certainly some things that we can do to, uh, to identify this stuff. All right, so kind of rounding things out here, Hail Mary. All right, so at this stage, it's a very rare situation that we haven't got what we needed to get, but there are those situations when we encounter a client or two, some of them are in the room that have super locked down environments that we are, are challenged with in, in doing what we do. Um, so we reserve this Hail Mary that I can't remember kind of the last time we had to use Hail Mary, but there is a, a Hail Mary component. Uh, on GitHub, there is a Metasploit module that you can download called PS Exec Scanner. And when you combine it with some of the methodologies that we've told you here today, like creating a shelter executable and using it as your, as your process that you launch within PS Exec, you can use this PS Exec Scanner to run a massive wide check of any systems that uh, allow you to upload the actual PS exec utility and gain your shell. Um, and that's really good for areas where a customer comes in and says, we've got antivirus and, and EDR and EDP running everywhere. And then we run these tools and we're like, oh, boom, 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 boom. Here's three machines that don't have antivirus that we logged into as a result of PS exec scanner. Then we impersonated tokens and boom, bam, done. So PS exec scanner is a good one. Uh, refined multi-relay. Okay, so who here has heard of Responder? All right, good. It's an SMB relay attack utility. It is the cat's meow. If you haven't heard of Responder, know that it's, like the, it's the way that we compromise 90% of the environments that we walk into within minutes, all right? And uh, SMB signing for the win, okay? That's all I'm saying, all right? Uh, so we'll use multi-relay in a way to target specific machines. Multi-relay is an extension of Responder and allows us to pick some specific machines that might have SMB signing disabled. And if it does, uh, we run mimic hats, we run a few other things that are really automated that allow us to get the, uh, the tools. But this is really noisy sometimes and produces some alerts. And then we'll run Responder with all the options, all right? ICMP, redirects, the rogue DHCP, the net BIOS domain suffixes, which are definitely guaranteed to cause some issues in the environment. Um, we'll use the force WPAT authentication attacks where if you run this tool, some of your targets might get a little pop-up most of those people just click in their credentials. You know, anybody who sees a Windows networking pop-up, that means I must enter in my credentials. So that's what they do. And we've developed some custom scripts and tools that are outside the, uh, the scope of this conversation because those are considered our intellectual property and we don't talk about those too much. 
Um, and then also, in worst case situ situations, we will uh, we'll run full based art poisoning. Whenever we do art poisoning, we're generally doing that in a very limited perspective due to the intrusiveness of, of art poisoning. But uh, if all else fails, we'll talk to our customer, we'll say, hey, we want to snag everything on this subnet from an art poison perspective, not just these few selected hosts. Is that OK? The answer is usually no. <laughs> so that's the Hail Mary component. All right, so from a summary perspective, there are a ton of different attack vectors that some of you may not have even heard about today, that you may not even be aware that this is, this is the way that the good guys are breaking into your environment, like our red team, and the bad guys are too. When you talk about attacks from nation state actors, when you talk about all these advanced, sophisticated ways that people are breaking into networks, these are some of the ways that they're doing it. Okay? And uh, compromise is inevitable, in my opinion. I think you've all heard that by now, right? The repetitive thing is you're going to get breached, you're going to get breached, you're going to get breached. You just got to be able to respond to it. You got to be able to detect it so that you can do the right things. My advice to those of you in the room today, focus your efforts on services, okay? Look at those, those services that are being spawned by different processes, okay? Look at those privileges if you're not triggering an alert whenever a new domain admin gets added, you should be, all right? That's, that's elementary stuff. But there's other things you can look for within privileges, too. There's ways that you can detect token impersonation. If you see there's logs in Active Directory or in an event viewer where you can see actual impersonation attempts. Because the first time we impersonate, sometimes it's not always successful. And then tunneling, that's one of the hardest things to look for, data exfiltration, tunneling capabilities. It's hard, but there's, there's, there's possibilities there. The last thing I want to wrap up with is um, I'm trying to, trying to create a, a piece of software or a script that operationalizes all of this. So imagine if I could create a little tool that said, give me your domain user, give me your domain password, give me a local host IP where I can drop my reverse shells on through a listener, push play, and it does all these things. It's in the very early infant stages. It's like alpha version, but it's going to you know, scrape your sysvol directory automatically. It's going to try to run the SMB auxiliary tool across the entire platform and drop the shells as needed. Kerberos, SPN tickets, all this is scriptable. So, Stay tuned for that. That's what I'm working on. Uh, that's it. <laughs> Any questions? Right here. Uh, yeah. Yeah. End user. End users hate it, right? Uh, Main reason primarily is when we when we like our social engineering uh, campaigns. Uh, if uh, first thing we try to do is we try to spoof your email domain. So if you don't have SPF set up and you don't have DMARC DKIM set up, we can just send an email from you know spoof your your domain. Uh, that's great. But generally most people are getting smart on that. Uh, so what we do then is purchase a typo squatted domain. So what that means is um, if you're Ford.com, I would purchase. F0RD.com, and I'd use that to send out with the hopes of a user just quickly glancing over that domain, not noticing any better, and clicking on our links, assuming the email came from Ford. So F0RD would come up as an uncategorized website. And we've also tricked, I'm not naming them any names, but we've also been able to get our malicious website categorized in a legitimate category just by making a simple submission request. So. Um, Correct. Yep. Good. Yep. Good. Good. Thanks again, everybody.